Hey, I'm Derek, it's me, Derek, and welcome to Stop Skeletons from Fighting. We just put out a massive breakdown and history of the Nokia N-Gage. The story was so fun and so interesting, we had to gloss over one very important aspect, the games. The thing you gotta remember is that the N-Gage was a huge step forward for gaming on cell phones, light years ahead of the Apple App Store. Nokia was the first to try it, that does not mean the technology was there yet. The N-Gage was not just a tough sell on its face in comparison to the GBA, DS, and PSP, but it was a whole different story for the developers themselves. One developer we spoke to called making a game on the N-Gage akin to developing a game for the ancient PCs, even calling the Nintendo DS a veritable powerhouse of gaming in comparison. Yet, dozens and dozens of games were somehow released on this thing, perfect for the show we call Punching Weight, a celebration of the weird, ambitious, and unnecessary. The Engage was a spectacular failure of a system, but it's time to check out the games. This part of the video is sponsored by World of Tanks. World of Tanks is a massive free-to-play game with over 100 million players worldwide and on PC. Look, I'm a tank and I'm rolling through fences. Better watch out. Also, other tanks. Other tanks better watch out too. Use all kinds of battle terrain and environments over dozens of maps to form your best strategy. What is this, some kind of world? of tanks? There's over 550 historical tanks with all kinds of customization options. Always a new way to play. Create your own steel stallion. This is the kind of game that's perfect for the World War II dad in your life. Or if you're entering your own World War II to Cold War dad era yourself. Download World of Tanks using the first link in the description. Use the code TANKMANIA to get seven days free of premium, 250,000 credits, the premium tank Excelsior, and three rental tanks for 10 battles each. The Tiger 131, the Cromwell B, and the T3485M. Check out that first link in the description, use the code TANKMANIA, and play for free. Thanks to World of Tanks for sponsoring this part of the video. Like all the other N-Gage videos we've done lately, I'll be playing all the games on the QD model. And strap in, because I'm about to treat you to some old school YouTube style gameplay footage. Film on the screen like it's 2007, baby. Hand modeling provided by myself and producer Grace. But why not just use emulation? Because we got the real thing, damn it. And I didn't think it would take us months to get an N-Gage, and then a working N-Gage, and then get new batteries for old cell phones, buy games, get a special memory card preloaded with games, but not one over a certain size, learn that we needed to get a dummy SIM card to play games. After so much energy and several hundred dollars, we were just too far in to just do emulation. Also, thanks to our Patreon supporters for making boondoggles like this possible. And to be fair, like I mentioned in the last video, so much of the N-Gage's faults come down to the hardware so that I can bring you the maximum Uncle Derek reaction. I needed, I needed to really experience the engage. I had to get in there. I had to, I had to engage with it. We start off with no less than the engages killer app. Though the Tomb Raider franchise wasn't doing so hot by 2003, it was still Tomb Raider, so Nokia managing to provide a version of the original game as one of their launch titles probably seemed like a great get at the time. Somehow not realizing that a re-release of a seven-year-old game probably wasn't the best basket to put all their eggs in. IGN at the time even called it a piece of gaming history gone portable, which makes me feel incredibly young, so thank you for that. And the first thing you notice upon boot up is that this is a fairly content accurate recreation of the original. I noticed small things like no save crystals in this early bridge room, which is understandable since you can save from anywhere. I mean, this is the end gauge. Welcome to the future. Using Lara's Angel of Darkness appearance might be the most noticeable visual difference here, a choice that aged just as well as this game's controls. All right, look, come here. Derek's got to pull you aside for some real talk. The original Tomb Raider had some garbage controls. Even on a controller with dedicated buttons, it's a clunk fest that's tough to go back to. Now imagine that on a cell phone number pad and a super squishy D-pad. <laughs> God, I love bad video games. But that's not even the worst of it. Friends, let me tell you about the automatic auto run where she won't stop moving unless you press down or walk. Where are you going, Laura? What are you running from? Porting this game to a keypad was always going to be a challenge, and this is one of those games where I think emulation just doesn't capture what the gameplay experience is, because these buttons are all kind of slippery, and the button assignment, well, I guess the button assignment's about as good as you would expect it to be, but Tomb Raider is a game that needs precision. Why add an auto run? Tomb Raider doesn't need this. Why make the controls of this game worse? 
My thumb started aching within 10 minutes of playing this thing. But again, I long ago aged out of the hip demo that Nokia was targeting in 2003. What I'm trying to say is that cell phone keypad Tomb Raider is a young man's game. And okay, I don't want to rag too much on this port because look at these graphics. We are in a full 3D space here and the game holds up pretty well on the frame rate front. I don't even mind the vertical screen so much because Tomb Raider is already a pretty vertical game. On the other hand, I can barely execute a side jump, but like this, it, it, it's here. This is Tomb Raider on a damn cell phone and it's kind of amazing. Developer Idleworks Game Studio actually added a really cool feature to this port, a movie mode, which you can access at any time by pressing the hashtag key, which back in my day, we called the pound key. I think it was because of bank accounts or for ordering deli meat over the phone. I think that was it. This mode lets you watch your game session from start to finish and even lets you do some rudimentary clipping to post on the Engage's online features. It's silky smooth and it's wild how recording clips wouldn't become a standard for another 10 years. This also tied into the Engage Arena Shadow Mode, which let you race against other players' shadow times. It's not something I can access now, unfortunately, but IGN called it surprisingly fun. There's a pull quote for the box. Tomb Raider was actually IdeaWorks Game Studios' first game, so it felt fitting to mention it here first since they did a score of other Engage conversions. And because Tomb Raider also happened to be the Engage's top selling launch title. With how much? Yep, just south of 3,000 copies for the entire launch month. I've never covered something on Punching Weight deemed to be so unnecessary by the public at large, but honestly, I think this port is impressive and is worth seeing to believe, even if playing the first Tomb Raider on a keypad is not recommended. We are not done with IdeaWorks yet though, they also brought us a spectacular port in the form of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. All said, it's pretty much a one-to-one -one port job of the original PS1 game, and it is solid. Most of the music and sound effects are there, oh, except for one minor thing, Superman my Goldfinger. How do you miss that? This is a direct crime against our bird lord and savior. Shame on everybody who worked on this port. Okay, but beyond that minor detail, all the levels and original objectives seem to be there. You got the apocalypse boxes, but not Superman? I'll stop. Sorry, I'll stop. It runs just about as well as the PlayStation 1 version did too. I had some slowdown, but nothing terrible. Let's get real here. Tony Hawk 1 on PlayStation weren't no spring chicken either. Loading levels does take a bit longer on Engage, but the retry function is really quick. Controls are the most important part to the Hawk experience, and my muscle memory just came right back to me, even on the Engage. This port works better than Tomb Raider, and I think it's partially due to the fact that Tony Hawk is a much less demanding game in terms of camera, and especially in terms of buttons. It's nice to play Tony Hawk and only have to worry about the two, four, five, and six buttons. Honestly, most complaints I'd have about this port are due to Tony Hawk 1 being Tony Hawk 1. Tony Hawk's 2 and 3 made incredible strides to the formula. Tony Hawk 1 has always been a little rough to go back to, and that is no different here. The weirdest aspect of the Engage port is that there are Tony Hawk 2 levels in the free skate mode. Not in the campaign, just the free skate mode. And it feels so weird playing them because the physics are slightly different and you can't do the manual. Also, there's no music at all for some reason. Who plays Tony Hawk in dead silence? And then some of the secret areas are already open or just straight up missing. The weirdest thing is why keep this a secret? It is not on the box anywhere. Yo, put that on the front featuring levels in Tony Hawk 2. What are you doing? Overall, I could see a Tony Hawk super fan carting this port around with them everywhere. Now, for the record, it was Tony Hawk 2 that got a GBA port, and then even then, all of those were isometric remakes, and the Game Boy Color port was completely its own thing. Tony Hawk 2 got a really good iOS port, but if I'm being honest, I might take a number pad over digital controls. For 18 years, this was the only real port of Tony Hawk 1. Still, it's worth mentioning that Tony Hawk 1 was a four-year-old game when the Engage port came out. It actually came out the same month as Tony Hawk Underground. But who would be crazy enough to port a PS2 game to the Engage? Who? Who, I ask? We now travel to a port of a more contemporary game, 2001's Red Faction. For a quick recap, Red Faction on PC and PS2 was a novel first-person shooter with almost fully destructible environments, giving you tons of ways to blow up your corporate overlords. With GeoMod as the game's defining feature though, a feature requiring some decently strong system specs to pull off, there was no way that N-Gage was going to be able to carry that over. Right? Well, if there was anyone out there who was capable of pulling it off, it would have been one of the founding fathers of the FPS genre itself, John Romero. With his newly formed studio, Monkey Stone Games, featuring another former id and Island Storm alum, Tom Hall, Romero set out to ensure that Red Faction would make its way to the Engage completely uncompromised. And this is the part where I tell you that it was compromised. 
Of course, it was too much to expect that the end gauge could go toe to toe with the PS2, but I actually left this shooter feeling that there were a lot of GBA shooters that did it better. Levels are super truncated, if not completely original, and Geomod is reduced to the occasional breakable wall, which I don't really have a huge problem with on its face. The thing that I don't like is the actual movement and combat. The frame rate is decent, but enemies tend to spawn off camera, and if you're not facing walls and strafing around corners, you're gonna get blindsided, and the controls just aren't really fast enough to counter this. Also, so the world feels empty and unmemorable. Unlike the original game, you start this red faction with weapons because enemies don't drop anything. And what feels like a new emphasis on platforming is really touchy. I never loved Red Faction's controls on the PS2, but here they have two different options that are activated by pressing 7 and switching to what could generously be called a dual analog style control, minus the jump button. It is baffling, but someone had to do it, right? At least it manages to run well, but the game never really throws that much at you. It's just... This is kind of a boring slog. I don't know if it's because I'm expecting more from Romero or because I'm such a pocket FPS connoisseur, but I was extremely whelmed. It was a... It was a whelming experience. One of the reasons I even wanted to bring this game up is because John Romero became a bit of a spokesman for the Engage. He seemed to really believe in Nokia's concept, even accidentally leaking the existence of the QD model way before he was supposed to. I don't think this is a great game, but it got pretty savaged by reviewers. This is not Romero's finest hour, that's for sure. At the end of the day, it's fine, but this port doesn't really feel like Red Faction, and for the record, isn't even a good example of what this system could do with an FPS. For that, I would turn to Ashen. Now, here is a shooter that is doing things that could not be done on the GBA. Ashen is an original FPS made by Taurus Games, the same people responsible for the awesome Doom 2 and Duke Nukem 3D GBA ports. Man, Taurus ruled the GBA and they rule the Engage too. Playing this game after Red Faction is a revelation in comparison. The music is kind of catchy, the sheer number of textures and lighting effects, oh my god, this reload animation? This is a punching weight it's all about, folks. Shooting feels really good, the controls actually make sense, the enemy design is excellent and creepy. What is this spider thingy? I don't know, but I I love it. I did notice more slowdown in this game than in Red Faction, but I'd rather play Ashen any day of the week. It's an exciting game that I actually want to sink my teeth into and play, and it's an original. As somebody who's played more GBA FPSs than any human being ought to, Ashen is absolutely one of the most impressive pocket FPSs I've ever played. But that's not all the first person action I got for you today. How could I talk about the Engage without mentioning its exclusive Elder Scrolls game, Shadow Key? Yes, the Elder Scrolls Travels Shadow Key. Now, for a bit of context, the Travels tagline marks a series of mobile phone entries in Bethesda's Elder Scrolls franchise made by sister company Virtuel. Oh, Virtual. I see what you're doing there. Studios. This is actually the third Elder Scrolls game made for phones, if you can believe it. The first two games, Stormhold and Dawnstar, do their best to evoke something like the original Elder Scrolls Arena, but within the limits of Java, aka J2ME phones, of course. But with the power of the N-Gage, they had the chance to really go for it. Nothing, nothing holding them back now with the end gauge. Technically, Shadow Key is an original game, not a port. So that's two originals now, sorry. But I was so impressed with what Virtual and Helper Studio TKO pulled off here that I had to show it off. So sorry for the clickbait, but now that you're here, get a load of this game. Oh yeah, this, this is the good stuff. Not only is this game in first person, it is also open world. They even fit in parts of Skyrim, Hammerfell, and High Rock in here. <laughs> No lady, I don't feel like finding Delfrain. I'm gonna go peace out to Ghost's Pass instead. And I should have been looking for Delfrain. A cold, maniacal laughter can be heard as you take your final breath. Before you the combat in this game just doesn't make sense to me. Usually I treat Elder Scrolls games with the tried and true whammo blammo, but it felt like I only hit enemies every third swing, no matter if I angled my viewpoint up or down. It might be because I chose to be a thief and the dagger has crap reach, but sorry, Uncle Derek is a feminine Khajiit thief. I don't make rules. Actually, Grace made the rules. These are her hands. Send your complaints to producer Grace. But overall, the 3D movement, the open world, the textures, the Morrowind music, the spec options, this is a huge upgrade from the two mobile games. Now sure, sometimes there is slowdown, but I prefer the sheer ambition in this game over something like Red Faction any day. And that's not all, folks. This game even had co-op via Bluetooth. Yes, the first Elder Scrolls game to have multiplayer came out in 2004 for the Taco Phone. I didn't try this out myself because there currently isn't an N-Gage emulator that supports Bluetooth, and emotionally, I wasn't ready to go out and buy another N-Gage. Though I will do it if y'all want me to. If y'all want me to do it, Cena, I'll do it for you. If you don't want me to, then I won't. We got other stuff I can do. 
One complaint I have about this game, and actually a lot of 3D Engage games in general, is that they are so dark. You can't really see in this video because our camera interprets the screen as brighter and a bit more washed out than it is in person, but even playing the first area with the brightness up at full blast is a bit of a challenge. Which is why sometimes in our footage you might notice that the Engage is uh, tilting. <laughs> That's because we're trying to see what's going on. It's kind of frustrating because one of my favorite things about the Engage is that mega bright screen. But hey, this is all keeping with that 2007 YouTube tradition, baby, taking you back to the past, as the great sage has said. The Engage ended up having a library of around 60 games, so I think it's gonna be a well I go back to because there's so much to talk about. I mean, on this channel, we talk a lot about GBA ports, but with the Engage, I could talk about GBA ports. So let me know if you wanna see that next. Uh, if you don't wanna see more Engage, don't worry. We got a lot of stuff planned. I want to say thanks to Scott Phillips for talking to us about developing for the Engage, and thanks to Kinsey Burke for letting us borrow her copy of Shadow Key, and thanks to Kelsey Lewin for letting us borrow her copy of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. And thanks to all our Patreon supporters down here. Like I said, we've been working on this video since like kind of like last year, but we do it again. We do it for you. We appreciate the support. We appreciate the love. We're actually filming this on uh, May 20th right now, and this is the six-year anniversary of the Monster Party video, which was the first video of Stop Skeletons and Fighting that we released back in 2015. That was the first Patreon-supported video. So, yo, it is officially six years we've been supported, and we thank, we love every single one, past, present, and future. So, speaking of the future, we get back to work keep making more videos. See you again real soon. Thanks for watching. Stay powerful.